Welcome to True House Stories. I am Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City, the only place in the world where music happens. Whoops. I didn't mean to say that. Chicago is another spot. We're going to make sure we clarify that because I just want to be able to wind it up. But to be honest with you, Chicago's got a huge story. And probably even bigger than New York at times. Because I know a lot of the boys and fellas that come out of Chicago and the talent is endless. And today, we got a very deep, spiritual, a man who turned out house music and changed the game. When we talk about game changers, this is a game changer. Tyree Cooper, okay? First of all, he learns how to rap. He learns how to do it all. He works for a distribution company, figures out the record industry, makes hit records, tours the world. He's got stories beyond stories. I'm going to bring him up. There he is. Um, please unmute yourself, Mr. Tyree. I want to introduce you to the world. I like to welcome the True House Story super duper trooper producer, the whole deal, Tyree Cooper. Word, 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 word. Peace, 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 peace. Okay, peace, Tyree, you comfortable? You relax, bro? For cheese, for cheese. You got your, you got your drink and you got everything ready? Okay, here I we go. Got my, definitely got First my drink. question I ask everybody, and then you could take it, you take us on the autobiography. And here it goes. How does music find a young Tyree Cooper? Well, uh, that starts about 1982. Um, summer school, uh, Hugo H. introduced me to the party scene, to a party scene, but uh, a friend of mine named uh, Sean, these brothers, Sean, Edward, and Norman, uh, kind of introduced me to the sound. I had no idea what was going on. I, I thought all that shit was just a melody or something like that, that uh, that they was running on the radio. Because hot mixing hadn't been, to me at that time, it wasn't a thing. So for me, it was um, by chance, so to speak. I was playing basketball. I was trying to, uh, I've said this story a thousand times. I was, I was trying to be, uh, I was trying to, I saw myself in the NBA, you know, as a basketball player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So music was the furthest thing from my mind. But in school, in high school, uh, I took music as a course because who the fuck flunks music? It's the easiest class in the world. Who who flunks music? A lot so, of people I knew did. Flunk yeah, music. dude, I knew. But anyway, yeah, um, I remember a lot of people flunk yeah. because they just didn't care because it wasn't the music that you're talking about. It was the the composition of the great study of. Yeah, again, I played. I mean, dude, I played. Finlandia, Tchaikovsky, I played uh, uh, Bach, anything that was woodwind, it would, anything woodwind, my um, music teacher made his play. So uh, what found what found found me was uh, 1982. Uh, I, I kind of, with all these people I mentioned before, Ebert, the, the, the Johnson brothers, and Hugo. One day Hugo said to me, Hugo Hutchison, shout out to Hugo H. He said to me, he said, uh, we went to the playground where Farley Jack Master Funk or Farley Funk and Keith played. He said, oh, man, Farley is messing up. I can do better than that. Oh, Farley messing up. I'm like, you can do better than Farley? No. I said, yeah, man, I do way better than Farley. Show me. So we went, we did school, uh, went to his crib, and he had the two turntables set up, you know, the mix and everything. My mouth dropped. I'm like, oh, man, he's he started doing the stuff Farley was doing in this house. So I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. You got to show me how this goes. Man, it take you too long. This is Hugo. You take you too long to learn this. No, no. <laughs> if you show me. So that was the beginnings. And within that, our senior year of high school. So it took me a year to figure out what the music was about. So uh, by the time I entered college, I went to two colleges. Uh, University of Wisconsin Stout uh, for about a for about a day and a half. I say that I I, I say that jokingly. Uh, I went to I went there first, but then after a while, uh, being from the South Side of Chicago and not really interacting too much with any other ethnic groups, I, I came home and went to Kennedy King. And from there, I told the, the basketball coach that I quit. 
and that I was uh, going to hang out with the radio guys. And he looked at me and said, uh, son, you're throwing your life away. What is music going to give you? I can get you in any school. I can get you wherever you need to be. If you want to play in Europe, I'm like, play in Europe? Man, who the fuck plays in Europe? I'm talking about the Bulls. I'm talking about the Pistons. I'm talking about anybody in the American uh, the National Basketball Association. Of course, you had to be good. I'm not saying I was a buster, but you had to be good. I, I think I was decent, but with but, training. But to be it, on it, NBA, it, to be an NBA level player, what's the height requirement? Uh, there isn't one. Because I know a football there is, right? With professional. Nope. No, nope. there, there is no. I, I always thought there was a high requirement with that. You know, the oh. only requirement is that you have the the mots to play the game because that is a game. And look, I mean, there's been there's been smaller players. Uh, Calvin Murphy was probably the shortest player uh, to date of, outside of this guy from who's five foot three. He plays for uh, he played for the Cleveland Cavaliers just a season or two ago. So there's always been short players. So it wasn't a thing. Um, for me, it was more uh, uh, another DJ friend of mine. <clears throat> shout out to my, my brother, uh, Nate, Nate Brooks Jr., who, uh, who uh, we played high school ball against each other at a basketball camp. He, he, he played at Loyola. He was he's six, four, six, five, but he could jump out the gym. I'm five, six at the time, five, seven. I could spot, I could pass the ball through the eye of a needle. You understand? So it, you had to have a certain skill set. That meant nothing to me. I just said, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to hang out with the radio DJs. And both coaches, the assistant coach, the head coach, like, man, you're throwing your life away. So that was the beginning for me as far as music. And that was a long part of the story, but. That's all right. Got to be told. It must be told. Yeah. So uh, uh, after that. Yeah, that was another lesson to be learned hanging out with the radio guys because, uh, uh, you know, they they were they were well advanced than I was. And um, I, I, I couldn't I, I didn't have any turntables or anything like that. So uh, Mike Dunn, <laughs> Mike Dunn and I took our grant money and bought records and turntables. What? <laughs> what? Wait! <laughs> Whoa, wait, that's why I had to say, wait a minute, you said grant money for the yeah. state? <laughs> yeah. Dude, Mike, but Mike Dunn, to, to, you have to ask Mike Dunn, but to his credit, um, no, it's I, all right. I, no, I thought no, Mike was going to be a professional football player. So did I. That's what I heard. Because Mike was in the 40, you're not catching the brother. You're not catching him. You're not catching him with a cold. So uh, uh, Mike was quick and he had hands. I don't know Mike. I don't know if you seen Mike. Mike got mitts for hands. So he was ca- he was all city, all everything. When he was in high school, but at the no, same he had glue, glue on the hand. The ball just stuck right. He just and it didn't. It didn't go nowhere. It didn't go nowhere. Um, but like I said, we lived in the same neighborhood. Or well, his grandmother lived in my neighborhood. So that's how we became uh, really good friends. I but, can hear Mike saying, "Yeah, man, yeah." He tired, tired, man. Tired. You you say tired. Too much time. Don't let me, man. Yeah, man. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, we took our grant money and bought records and turntables and everything. So we, for people in Europe, that grant money is from the federal government. That's an allowance (laughs) to give you a chance to start paying. You know, you got monies from the state you lived in and federal government (laughs) when you were incentive to go to college to get a degree. They had another. They had another idea in mind. Oh, we was <laughs> dude. We we piece to the piece to uh, Gladys Pizarro. I just saw a uh, piece. That's my my sister from another mother. Um, you, they're all coming uh, in this here, you brother. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah. So we took our grant money and just started, you know, buying records. And you know, he bought some turntables. And every day, every day, we were supposed to be in school. But we and our you friend, were, you were in school. In man, school. were we in school? We was in the. the 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 school of hard knocks university of hard knocks in the university of DJing because we spent 16 hours every day learning how to DJ 16 from sun up literally to the to the wee hours of the morning learning to DJ learning the music learning the record so <clears throat> this was uh 
all part of the test. And Hugo H was the uh and this the constellation, Hugo H was the uh elder statesman because he had been DJ already for about four or five years, but before we started. So uh and so that was pretty much the, my humble beginning. And Mike Dunn and I stayed DJ partners for I don't know, a couple of years, maybe a year, some change. And then, you know, we, you know, we grew apart. Yeah, of course, like anything happens, you start out with an idea and everybody wants to have their piece of the game. So yeah, this- we, we grew apart because he was on the southwest side. I was on the southeast side doing parties. Uh, gotcha. two, di- two different type of factions. Yeah, but can you explain yeah. that, Chicago? Because people don't understand that. Like north side, west side, south side, where the projects are, is rough. I remember, woo! I remember going to eat with Ron. Yo, gates in front of the windows, gates in the place. You have to order to wait for your food to bring it to your own table. Yeah, Brooklyn is not like that. Brooklyn no, is- <clears throat> there's no <clears throat> for no. Harlem was like that back in the day, years and years back. So okay. I only remember Harlem like in 88, 89. And Harlem in, that 80, in 88 was kind of a bit different. I, I, I Like going to the bodegas and stuff uh, uh, up in the city, up in uh, up in. Uh, the, Can you grab the box next to the thing? You know, to tell the guy he's behind the window. I'll go, go to the thing. No problem. Right, yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, what do you want to do? I want the tile mall and the pistol. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some places the like the pistol and the bullets and the tile mall. I'll take your money. Chicago, but not all places, but uh, at this particular time, but like Chicago, like Chicago is a, is a uh, segregated city for anyone that doesn't know that. I, I want to say it's still the most segregated city in the country, but um, during this particular time, so anything, if you if you've been to Chicago ever and you've been downtown, Zero Street. Is state, uh, state and Madison. That's zero. North, south, east, and west. So everything is divided from that. And the lake being the being the east. So anything the west of the lake is pretty much they're considered the west side or the west side of State Street. I'm sorry, not, uh, state. Let's say State Madison. Yeah, anything west of State Madison, anything east of State Madison, going towards. Uh, the south side and going towards the north side. So that's pretty much how Chicago is, di- is divided. So me saying the south east side and the southwest side, uh, most of my parties were done um, uh, southeast because it was the east side of State Street going towards the lake. Uh, Mike Dunn was south, vaguely southwest going towards the Going west of the lake, the furthest from the lake, right to uh-huh. the center. So, uh, and then north side was, you know, so predominantly these four sections. <clears throat> it was black, white, Hispanic, and uh, and or other, as I say. Um, but uh, uh, but me doing parties with the likes of like Ferris Thomas and Steve Poindexter and people of this nature. That was the east side. Mike was doing parties uh, with with his boys. Uh, on the southwest side. So uh one summer, uh one summer, uh one summer. <laughs> I've already seen there's a problem. We gotta clean up this actually clean. He's gotta think this tour where it's like one summer. Um one they, summer. They, yeah, one, so they played a trick on me because for a while me and Mike didn't even speak for for like a whole summer. And that's like that's my little brother. That's my one of my best, but that's my you know. That's and a talented point. brother, no less. <clears throat> Always have been. Uh, he, Mike can fix. Mike can fix a tape deck without the script, without the uh, schematics. He don't need. He don't need the mother to look at the mother. Incredible, incredible, the talented dude. So anyway, uh, they tricked me. They said. Uh, they said. Uh, uh, hey, time man. You know. You know. Back in the day, twelve hundreds was when you poor and you you brother you black and you poor. Turntables was hard to come by. You know, especially some twelve hundreds, and so they got me with, "Hey, man, we bought some turntables, uh, some twelve hundreds and everything. Won't you come check them out?" I'm like, "Nah, dog. I got this. I got this female. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to, you know, woo off the bam. I'm trying to, you know, you know, have some good times. Man, 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 come on down. It'll take a minute. Make a long story short. I went down to my friend's basement. It was a hot summer, so they figured to get a to get a laugh out of me, they just doused me with water. Oh. <gasps> So they got a bucket of water and just doused me. 
And they thought it was funny. I, I did it. Uh, so I, I didn't mess with them for like... Wait, wait. So were you dressed up to go out for the Slice of Life date? What was the deal? Because you must have been prepped if you got that upset. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a. I wouldn't call it a. Um, you know what I'm saying. You were prepped. I, call it, I, call, I was. I wasn't suited and booted. It was a. You know, hey, what you doing? Booty call. I hear you. Well, you were ready. You were fresh and clean and ready for the day. And they was like, "Hey man, come check out these twelves. I'm like, "Yeah, I check this shit out tomorrow." Right? No, 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 no. Okay. Now, they, now. And when I came down there, uh, they dropped me with water, and then they told me later on that they followed me back home because, yeah, because I left footprints in the street of me walking down the street being wet. Yeah, so um, so for a while, Mike and I didn't speak to each other. I mean, like, I was, I, I really felt a certain way. You were thoroughly angry. Thoroughly yeah, Because I, I would have never did that to any of my friends. It still happened to this day. So when I start messing with the East Side promoter, Steve Poindexter, John Hunt, people of this nature, I started figuring out the the promotion game. Um, and I said, look, I'm gonna start throwing these type of parties from the east side on my side of town. But what's gonna be the draw? So I was like, hmm, Mike and I ain't speaking, we the two biggest DJs in the neighborhood. So, hmm, a battle, Tyree versus Mike Dunn. That draws people, and it was supposed to be in a, 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 a mutual friend's basement. He had a decent basement and everything. So he, I talked to him, you know, bygones be bygones. You know, you talk talk it out. And he said, yeah, but I was like, look, it ain't going to be no battle because, again, Mike Dunn is a talented motherfucker. He, he, any, 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 anything on some turntables this brother was doing back in the day. I know he's he's all Frankie Knuckles out and, you know, the, you know, the knobs and everything, but on some Jazzy Jeff and a friend, some Jazzy Jeff and some Kid Capri type shit. Oh, Mike Dunn was that he was that dude. So I was like, not even gonna be a real battle. It's gonna be more or less uh, a party to make some money. Right. Like, okay, I'm down. And uh, within that time frame, our friend, our mutual friend, said he couldn't have it in his basement. So they knew this um, VFW hall, this Veterans of Foreign Veterans for Foreign uh, Wars uh, hall. So we had it there. And I kid you not, man, the first night we opened up, we uh, I think we called it the earthquake, which was I was reminded of. Shout out to my boy, uh, Paul James. We called it the earthquake. The first night we opened it up. Now, maybe, then he honestly it had about, it held about, let's say 50 people. Let's say they held about 50 people inside. Bruh, bruh, bruh. It was about 500 motherfuckers coming through that one. <laughs> The entire area was coming to that party. We, it, it was so many people outside because they couldn't get in. The police had to come and control. And it was right next to, we. it was people in, it was next to a gas station. There was people in the gas station dancing outside. You understand what I'm saying? The next door neighbor, they could, they didn't get no sleep for a few weekends because we was, we were we were to four o'clock in the morning with this, you know, from eight to four. Every Meanwhile, day. I know in Chicago things closed at two, if I remember correctly. Right, right. right. This was before then. Back in the day, uh, you could get away with four o'clock in a neighborhood like Inglewood. Hey, look, long as the kids wasn't uh, doing a uh, what is it called a one eleven, a two eleven, breaking and entering, or something like that. You got a one eleven breaker, breaker one eleven. Two eleven, two eleven, actually breaking and entering. Two eleven, a two eleven down the area. Uh, so as long as they weren't doing that, police were pretty. It was way chill back then than they are today. Oh God, it was so different back then. So you know they controlled and made sure you know it was. A, they would a do this, bro. Event. They would do that. They would know what's going on. They just went like that. Exactly. And we talking about these are, t we, man, we were the oldest. Like, we was in our 20s. We talking about kids that was 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, just having a blast. And the police, as long as you wasn't being disruptive or anything like that, yeah, they looked the other way. So that was the beginning of it. And again, like I said, it was a summer thing. So um, my godfather, he, uh, he asked me, he said, hey, man, hey, I want to do a party at this 
you know, adult place or whatnot. I'm like, all right, cool. I'm thinking I'm going to play for adults. He said, no, 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 no. I want some kid that, that y'all be having at y'all parties. Oh, okay. He said, what do you need? I blame my God if I need this, this, this. He gave him the money. I got it. He he, uh, he said, uh, who, who else you need that, that's going to DJ with you? I was like, my oh, man, Mike Dunn. That's, that's it. That, that's all I need. And so that was the, the beginnings of the, the Mike Dunn, Tyree Cooper kind of collaboration. You know, uh, we were there for our first records, you know what I'm saying? For I Fear the Night, uh, for his uh, dance mother, which was another story in its own right. Um, yeah, so that's that's been my brother. That's That was the beginning of Tyree. That was the beginning. In right. a nutshell. I didn't get too deep into it because there's, you know, there's a lot of parties that goes along with it, uh, playing downtown. Like, um, if you were from Chicago at a certain period, there were the uh, infamous hotel parties that were being thrown. So um, so what years would you say these are exactly? This is 84. My, my, my involvement from 84. I did my first hotel party, 85. So like 85, 80, into 84, 85 to 86. You know, okay. was, 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 was it? So, so what is, were you playing dance music through the whole night or playing also hip hop and stuff too at those parties? No hip hop, bro. No, no you gotta tell people, tell the people. Don't tell no, me. No, I'm saying no hip hop, bro. No hip hop. Kings and Queens, no hip hop. I love it, but we wasn't playing no hip hop. No, no, no. That was the last thing. Um, it wasn't a bad thing. It was just, this was a post disco event and again I, I, I gotta specify that because yeah we played disco records but we was playing anything with the heavy beat that's why when the first house record came out we didn't necessarily play on and on we, we flipped the motherfucker over and all those tracks that was on the side uh, the other side is what we ran so the better the track the better the you know the, the better the track the better the mix the better the mix the better the party um, which that which we called house, and not necessarily on and on, but five A, and then when when Jesse did that, Farley came out with his his stuff, and you had um. That was the thing about being a DJ back in the day. Depending on who you were, you had privy. You were privy to get the serious, seriously exclusive shit that was only on cassette because vinyl was it was not on vinyl at all. It wasn't, I didn't, we didn't know about dub place or anything like that. And that was a Jamaican thing. Um, but we, we had cassettes of, you know, depending on what song it was. Uh, Jamie Principal or Steve Hurley <clears throat> or Steve Hurley um, okay. or, or whoever. So, you know, by playing these beats, it made our parties hot. And for, like I said, from 85, 84 to 86, my involvement, man, you, we, we talking about, the creme de la creme records of house music. Music is the key before it came out. Uh, anything from Jamie before it came out. Uh, 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 Steve Poindexter stuff before it came out. I mean, a whole lot of tracks. Mike Dunn, Tyree Cooper stuff before it came out. You know, all these records were being made before before it actually, before y'all heard them. You know, before the rest of the, the, the world heard them. So uh, that was the other fortunate thing about being a DJ in Chicago back in the day, the uh, amount of music that you had. So you would play Dirty Talk, you would play a client of NBO, I say like that, you'd play a client of NBO. Hell, you might even play Mufoon Bay, but at the end of the day, when it's time to when it's time to get jacking, now nah, you break, you plan, you know, your time to jacks, your house energies, your funking with the drums, your uh, 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 funk you up beats with the uh, since a black woman uh, over, over, over on top of it or whatever, or just regular beats that people were making. <clears throat> so this was our, this was house music to us. Uh, I, I, like I said, I, the disco part, uh, it was there, but it was more the beats for us. It was the, it was the beat. Cause that was in a sound, with a, with a nice sound system. Yeah. You could dance to Dr. Love, but when that, And that shit was boom, boom, boom. Dr. Love was here, but the other one was here. You know what I'm saying? It was the energy. And at one point, after one point, 
it wasn't no disco happening. It was only Chicago based music. You understand? Know from from wherever, from wherever it came, from black, white, and or other. Mm. It was just us in Chicago. Right. No, I get that. I understand that because um that 909, that drum machine is all about that. See <laughs> that boom. It's like Man. And and that was funny thing. When I saw like in the nineties, I saw uh what a live act was coming from the eighties, what a real live act was. Um, and they bring out the equipment. I'm like, man, we was doing that shit in the eighties. It wasn't nothing. To bring out an 808 or a 909 and have it into a system. Oh my gosh. You're talking about turning the party on. It was over. Oh yeah. It was over. But um those were the days. Those were the happy. happy the more distorted the record sound, the better it was. The, 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 the acid thunder, uh, uh, acid thunder, all those yeah. records. Oh my oh, god. Oh yeah, that. That was the later days. We talking about like stuff like um uh before before the before they start redefining a sound system. You know what I'm saying? So like we talking about like records like uh Funkin' with the drums from Farley had a heavy hit. Jesse Saunders 5A had it, because these are 909s, Lynn drums, and 808. Chip E time to jack or his house. Chip That's e. right, Price. time to jack. Yep. That shit ran amok. You, it was, it was our day of, uh, 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 uh what's that song from Cashman? Uh, Percolator. That was our version of the Percolator. Because today, if you play the Percolator at any party in Chicago, there goes your party. That I mean, old and or young, it's a rap. That was the same thing for us with his house or time to jack, because the eight oh eight was kicking in. And uh, and it just made the party sound that much more livelier. So the heavier the kick drum with the system, yeah, it, that was that made the party. That's what made me do "I Fit a Night" with the the heavy kick drum on "I Fit a Night" because I wanted that shit to beat in the sound system. No matter where you are, I want that shit to sound just like it did as I heard it that day. You know what I'm saying? So uh, that was again that was our house. So at one point in time, we wasn't playing nothing else from nobody else, man. It's just Chicago. Yeah, right. Getting it down and doing it right, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, take us on the trip now. So we got a transition now. We're going into the music industry because you guys oh, are yeah. on the Chicago thing. So you got to take us on your walk, the path to the music. Okay, so so around... Okay, look, like like the first, the first time... The first time... Uh, after, after, you know, in the interim of learning all this about the scene that I'm, I'm about to embark on, <clears throat> um, Jesse Saunders put out uh, the first house record. So, sorry, sorry, sorry. That's Tyree's management saying, "Don't you dare say a word." I know, right? Keep it I'm for the sorry. Book. Keep it for I know, the book. I know. That's that shit is crazy. There we go. Sorry about that. Right. Anyway. Uh, Jesse Sutton's put out the first house record. Please excuse me, y'all. I didn't set my my parameters. But anyway, uh, as he was doing that, I was learning about how this shit was made. So Jesse, big brother Jesse, shout out to Jesse Saunders. He didn't know me from Adam. He, he, I, I, again, I had a thing about telling, stretching my truth back in the day. You know, uh, uh, so I told Jesse that I was a big DJ on college radio and I didn't think Jesse paid attention to any of that. I'm looking at him and Farley as these very iconic figures and, and that things of that nature. So I asked Jesse, could I come pick up some records? Cause shit, I didn't have no money to buy them in college. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I ain't got no money to buy no music. I'm, I'm in college. I, I didn't get no grant that day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> So <clears throat> I asked him, to, could I come over to his house? So he invited me over to his house to pick up the records okay. uh, in his mother's house. So when I walked in there, I see all this equipment, like these 808s, this keyboards and all the rest of this shit. I'm like, the fuck is this? Music in school, compared to what I saw Jesse have, was nine different things. So when I'm seeing all these drum machines, I'm like, oh, man. And uh, I, I really want to say... 
I really want to say I heard this other record from Wayne Wills before it was even released called Undercover because he, he hit the drum machine and this 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 these beats came on and I was oh yeah yeah okay I I, I know about that and in my head I'm going god damn god damn god damn but I'm like yeah 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 that's cool man you know that's yeah that's, that's, that's real it. cool yeah. you got some nice gear went back and told Mike and Hugo man I was at Jesse crib and he got woo, 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 woo. So I figured out I got to learn how to use this equipment. No one I knew outside of Jesse Sanders had an 808, 909, 707, whatever, right? Was he rich? <laughs> to, to me, he was rich. Well, because if I walked in, I would have been like... <laughs> to me, he was rich. In those days, none of us had two nickels to rub together in those Ooh, days. Two nickels? You were still richer than me and Mike. We was trying to get pennies, bro. I know. We was trying to get pennies. But anyway, so when he said that, um, when he let me come over and I was like, I, okay, I got to figure out how to do this. So uh, again, this is all within that time period, grant money and everything. I bought a Gemini drum machine. All right. Right. No. Gemini. There you go. See, see, that's that look. You go Gemini. I didn't know they made a drum machine. I, thought, I, read, I, just, I said, wait a minute, Gemini. I don't know. It, 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 it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it cost <laughs> I still remember Mike saying this to me. I still remember Mike. Yeah, nah. He said, he said, uh, he's like, I said, Mike, I got a, I got a beat machine. I got, I got a beat machine because that's what we called it. I got a beat machine. Oh, uh, straight up, straight up. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It cost me ninety nine dollars, man. <laughs> uh, straight up, straight up. We didn't know how much that shit really cost, man. Hey, uh, you hear me? Yeah. Word is born. Ninety nine dollars. Like, yo, because that was the grant money I had, Joe. I'm like, yo, we need to make some music. <laughs> when, I, when, I, when, I, when I went down there to uh, when, I, when I when I took it down to Mike and uh, what did he say? He went, man, what is this? I bet he said that, man. He said he, said, he, said, he looked at it because it was all pre-programmed beats, bossa nova, yeah, disco B, you know, some kind of break broken bass, whatever beats they had up in there, and so <laughs> so he's got the he's got the beatbox machine. Bos Bossa Nova, Cha Cha, Foxtrot, that goes next. Exactly, to the I know exactly. what that is. You put that next to the organ back in the day. They used to put those things on the guy playing the exactly. organ. Exactly, I did oh. not know anything oh, about that. Yes. And so Mike said, Mike said, Mike say, "Hey man, <laughs> I can't hey say. Man. It, it, it ain't got no other beats on here but this one." Like, yeah, man, <laughs> man, man. man. Man, yeah, no, nah, Ty, no, nah, dog. This is like I guess you want to say, yeah, Ty, this is cool, but bro, this ain't the this ain't the thing we need. So uh maybe a year, some change later, uh a good friend of ours, another mutual friend of ours, uh of ours named uh uh Ted. We explained to Ted what we needed. <laughs> uh and he kind of kind of got it. But in between that, I, 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 one of my friends that I, uh, I went to summer school with, because uh, that's how I graduated high school, I went to summer school with, uh, he was going to this church, and at the basement of this church, this guy named Kevin <clears throat> was was uh, teaching music classes. Now, I had music in high school, didn't need that. But what he had was a DR-110 drum. All right. So... For me to understand what the one, two, three, four was, I understood it. If I saw it on a scale, if I saw it on the, on the music scale, I, I can understand quarter note, quarter note, quarter note, quarter note, half note, half note, half note, whole rest, three. You know, I, I can understand. I can read music, but house music, making house music, was something totally different to me. So when he said the first track I made was like I was trying to make this. Um, but we, before you go to that, how did you all know it was house music? Because back at that time, we didn't really know it. We did. We, 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 we already, in Chicago, man, we was calling the house before the, I said, before the world even knew what it was. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, hey, we was calling house. No, I get, let me get specific. If you lived in a certain area, you called it house. Because... That was the word that was passed from the older DJs. Like uh, the first person I heard called house, the music house was Leonard Roy. He was the closest I could get to 
Farley because he witnessed me in my beginning. Now, because I used to go to his parties too. I, I just over I skipped him because going to Farley, but I used to go to Lennon Roy parties too at the Ring Zone. But he was the first person I heard call the music house. So that's what we called it was house. Um, uh, so when I uh, went down to the basement of this church and uh, producing this erotic record in a church, like some kind of, yeah, man, I was, boy, I was somewhere else. Because uh, I, I wanted to sound like Central's Black Man. Central's Black Man, I want you to... But I, I couldn't say those. Well, the people I had, they couldn't say the words, so I had them moan like they was having sex. In the church? In the church, down in the basement. Recording it. Like a champ, bro. Like a champ. Doing a porno without a porno. Like a champ. Oof. So. Uh, Sacrilegious all night long. All right. So, uh, so that was my first learning how to make one, two, three, four. Mike Dunn will tell you a different story, but that is the truth. That's your eyes. That's what happened. Yeah, that is the truth. Because the guy, yes. even, he even said, he even hit me on um, Facebook some years back and congratulated me on the music career that I had. So he taught me how to make the one, two, three, four, two, and four, uh, five and 13, right? The one, th one three, five, nine, and 13, one, two, three, four in the drum machine. And uh, five and nine with the snare and everything else is whatever it's going to be. So once I did all that, then I started making records. Uh, like I said, my first record was kind of like a porno kind of thing. And then it just kind of went off from there. And I was on a drum machine high, so to speak, trying to find and learn out the best drum machine. So by 1986, <clears throat> entered Marshall Jefferson. Now... When I say 1986, 86 is when I released the record. But 85, in the 85, we kind of met him because we had a club uh, on the south side. It used to be called the Sheba Disco, but we, we renamed it to uh, Club My House for my, for my godfather. So Marshall brought all this fucking equipment to our, to our club. He, the Ibanez uh, effects box, this big, big ass 32 track mixing board. Uh, 808, 707, uh, drum machine, 727. He had all the gear. We looking like. He's a Mac daddy. He's a true baller. So he's like, yeah, can I keep this stuff here in y'all, uh, in y'all, uh, in y'all spot? Yeah. Me like, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So we all learned, we all took turns. We all took turns programming beats for ourselves. And, and, and things of this nature. So within that time, again, within that time, because it's only it's only been two years since I started DJing, two and a half years since I started DJing, right? So within that time, house music was being formed. The whole scene was being formed. So Marshall came down and said, uh, "Yeah, y'all can keep, you know y'all can keep this equipment." He went in the studio. He was making Jungle Ones. Time marches on, right? So these records hadn't been out. The only record he had had out was at the time was I've Lost Control, right? So he given us cassette tapes. As I say before, the cassette tape, we had records or the material that no one had. And that's what made you the you know the, that dude because you had records and you played the records that no one had, right? That makes the DJ, especially no, back then. One second, let's let's make everybody get a commercial in this because this is gonna get real steamy. Give me one second. Hang on. Right. Make sure you put